Welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Hello and welcome to the Pac-Man podcast. I'm Cindy. I'm Kat. And I'm Trevor. And this week we are doing another marine mammal highlight and it was between the beluga and the walrus and this one was uh, blown out of the water. <laughs> but belugas won by far, landslide, water slide maybe. Um, so which was fun um, and the reason why we had the beluga up there is because we recently had a beluga sighting in the Puget Sound which is really weird because as you'll learn in this podcast they're from the arctic <laughs> and they're not supposed to be down here um there was a sighting was it last year in san diego i was off Beautiful, california yeah um so th th there's been some guys that are doing some weird traveling um but we were excited to uh, hear about the beluga that was here um and we'll talk a little bit about him as we uh, him or her actually don't know if it's a him or her uh, <laughs> i was gonna say yeah, Good point. Um, uh, throughout it. But anyway, we're excited to do belugas because they're super cool. Um, and Trevor's going to start us off with the um, what they look like and distribution and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So they're probably one of the more recognizable whales that people know because they're a really popular aquarium whale. They're mm -hmm. easy to keep, I guess you could say. Um, I think the Vancouver Aquarium, do they have them anymore? I know oh. local wise. I don't they, think the Seattle Aquarium or not Seattle I Aquarium, think they but. used to. I don't think they have any cetaceans anymore. Mm -mm. Yeah. yeah, for a lot of reasons behind reasons that too. stuff. But anyway, <laughs> um, they, like you said, are from the Arctic circumpolar. So Arctic and subarctic waters. Um, but basically imagine the North Pole and as far south as the St. Lawrence River. Mm -hmm. For the very popular, the normal range. Like very famous population there. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And apparently one that comes to Puget Sound. <laughs> yeah. But they are migratory, so they generally are more coastal in the summer because the ice is gone. Because in the winter, obviously, it's icy and you can't breathe when there's ice. Um, some stay in the pack ice during the winter, but they need those holes in the ice or those lanes of cracking ice because otherwise they're going to drown. Right. Uh, yeah, that's the range, but most people know what they look like, but creamy white. You know, solid white, but calves are born gray. I always find that really crazy when you see one. You're like, wait a minute, but you're supposed to be like blonde, like light, bleach white. Why are you gray? <laughs> Which is odd to me because the theory is the reason for white is because they camouflage with the ice. You would so you think, think the calves you want would the calves want to camouflage them. with the ice as well. Yeah, maybe maybe they're camouflaging with like maybe it's like a shadow or something because they're usually well, maybe like kind of under the female or. Well, and I was gonna say, I mean, the calves are presumably born in the summertime, right? Mm -hmm. presumably yeah yes so i mean there there is going to be slightly less ice in the summertime but they're also not fully white till about seven years old oh okay never mind oh, there goes that <laughs> <laughs> never mind so there's that yeah interesting <laughs> um size wise there is minor sexual dimorphism which was surprising to me i didn't know that the males huh. can grow up to 18 feet and 3500 pounds <sighs> And they, I think a couple of them, like 4,500, whereas the females only are 13 feet and 2,600 pounds. Oh, that's so like difference. five foot different. Yeah. And they get about max size at about 10 years old. Okay. That's a, yeah. That kind of makes so, sense. I'm assuming it's a slow growth living in the Arctic. Yeah, probably. Slow-ish, but. Yeah, I mean, the, like maturity wise, the females become sexually mature between six to 14 years of age and males even slightly older than that. So it kind of makes sense that they're not going to yeah. be adult size till 10 or more. Mm -hmm. They are super fat. Uh, <laughs> super tiny. They have just like rolls of fat. <laughs> yeah, literal, literal rolls. Well, they, gotta be, they, they have to have that. I mean, they're in super freezing water. Yeah, so. they're, they live in waters of eight, zero to 18 degrees Celsius. So they have... 40 to 50 percent of their body weight is fat That's bad. which That's can be up to six sense. inches thick yeah i read that it was like six inches yeah like which that. is compared you know it's to 40 to 50 percent fat comparatively it's about 30 percent fat in, in on average in other cetaceans yeah okay but they're also in the coldest water so 
Yeah, well, I mean, but you have some of the larger baleen whales that go up into the Arctic, but they're not there all the time. So yeah. I guess that's in a way they that makes it's less cold. Yeah. Hawaii, you know, yeah. Right. Um, you would want to have a, a blanket on that thick when you go to Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> and in relation with that fat, with the white skin, they do shed that skin annually too, which is kind of mm-hmm. cool, which is weird to think about. Yeah, and they they'll like they'll like roll like the, some of the orcas do like on rocks and stuff like that to kind of slough it off. Actual I think I did work. see that not every population does that. I think only some like some of them lose it, but not all of them. There's a lot of variation within the populations. Yeah, which is interesting. Lots of variation because mm-hmm. they're circumpolar, and so they can go to the Pacific Ocean, they can go to the Arctic, or you know, right? Very different habitats yeah, and diets, which we'll talk about. But mm-hmm. um, their melon, which is the bulbous part of their head, the coolest is part, huge compared to other cetaceans if you've seen finding dory you can kind of get the gist <laughs> it's like very cro magnon like yeah. very giant forehead and it can move too with the sound that they make so they use their nasal cavity to move to echolocate and all that so if you can you know there's videos you can actually see the head just moving which is kind of neat yeah but it's really, have you ever seen one in captivity and stuff sometimes you'll see that if they're doing it and it, it literally goes it's not just like a small little like blip that you might see it's like right Somebody's massaging their forehead as they're. <laughs> <laughs> and they they can, their vertebrae at their neck are not fused either. So they can move their head up and down to the side. I mean, some, some well, the, you know, baleen whales can't really do that much. But some, some they, of the dolphins can do a little bit, but like river dolphins have a bit more. It's more rigid. It's more like a, yeah, versus yeah. they can actually like t- twist, not twist, but, you know more more maneuver they, they can turn their heads more yeah yeah which is more. theorized probably for hunting but also maybe for predator evasion oh yeah that makes sense yeah i'm gonna be able to check your mirrors exactly <laughs> <I do. laughs> uh let's see here they have oh yeah my last one i have they have don't good lord they don't have a dorsal fin they have a dorsal ridge which some people have theorized is more of like a you know, use it as a ram to break ice, which I don't think has been proven. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, the other one I saw was that they don't have it so that they can go through it, not, not necessarily ram it, but just it doesn't get stuck and rub up against ice yeah. and stuff. It's a big giant dorsal fin would be not great there. <laughs> yeah, the theory too was like, why have it if you're in such a cold area? There's more body area or to right. lose heat. That's true. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. But yeah, f- physiologically wise, though, they are pretty good at keeping warm i mentioned the fat but they have arteries that obviously feed blood to their fins but they have veins that surround those arteries too which can mm. constrict or expand in right. relation to the, what they need for heat contention so i wonder i mean that's a, that counter current system is pretty common in in most cetaceans i, I, yeah. I would assume that theirs is just like extra better i think so yeah <laughs> it's more insulating <laughs> better be yeah because right, that would be terrible. Like you had the, the veins coming back with like super cold blood. You imagine that going like into oh. back into your heart and like, oh, that would be so like. I just made me like, shiver. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want that to be warmed up before it goes back. <laughs> and there's some fish in the Arctic and Antarctic too with, it's basically antifreeze in their blood too. Yeah. Like special oh, protein. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they have that. That'd be cool, but. That would be cool. I just, I um, remember hearing yeah. about that with fish though. That was like, wow. That was the actual yeah, antifreeze yeah. basically. Makes sense. And then the last thing I'll mention with the whole dorsal fin, fins and all that, their genus name is Apteris, Apteris, I'm probably butchering that, which is Greek for wingless. So no dorsal fin, wingless. Oh, that's just, I wouldn't have done that because, I mean, I don't see the dorsal fin as a wing. You know, you think the pectoral fin fins as a wing, yeah. but I suppose it's a different type of wing. Well, there you go. Cool. Nice. Well, uh, I will go straight into the diet with that, the diet and behavior. There's a, so there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> and Cat has a lot to talk about with threats because these guys, there's a lot, especially with climate change um, that we'll kind of go through a little bit here. So for the diet, um, belugas aren't picky eaters, which is a good thing. We've talked about that in other podcasts, but if you're a specialist, you might have problems. And especially with climate change and sea ice that we're going to be talking about, um, the Arctic species have a bit more direct issues with what's happening with warming climate. Um, so the fact that they are, aren't are picky eaters is good for them 
for the long term. Um, they eat octopus, squid, crab, shrimp, clam, snail, sandworm, salmon, eucalon, cod, herring, smelt, and flatfish. <laughs> just to name. To name just a few. Just a couple. <laughs> I think so I saw. They... Hmm? Oh, I just I saw that they eat coho salmon too, which is weird because obviously we have coho salmon. Because hmm. coho yeah. salmon migrated up to Alaska too, which is where they are. So that was just right. weird to me. Well, and the and the ones in Cook Inlet, especially, they like to eat salmon. Yeah, it's right there. Um, so, you know, they go where the food was. Um, they, the research that I was looking at um, showed that they're, they're, they're really good at, they dive to the depths and the parts of the water column that have the best chances for finding prey. So I think that's, you know, kind of common, but I think they're, again, kind of better at doing that. They'll, whatever prey that they're going after. So their, their dive patterns and depths will vary um, depending on which species they're deciding to eat that day or that morning or afternoon or whatever. <laughs> um, so, but the, the, that sea ice, um, so the issue with sea ice is that as climate change, and I'm not sure Kat will get more into this, but the, as the climate changes and warms, the sea ice patterns are different. So they're melting, let's see, was it, they're melting earlier and freezing later. So the summers are longer, um, but the, animals that depend on that sea ice and those time patterns of it are being affected by this change in when they melt and when they freeze and how much of it, right? So there's not as much sea ice as there used to be because of that warming. So um, what's interesting is this affected their, their behavior in a recent study. Um, they usually dive between two to 20 minutes um, to an average of about 164 feet. But after the sea ice began declining, they increased the depth to an average of 210 feet. Um, and they dove for longer times per day. So they used to dive for like one 20 minute dive and everything else was much shorter to three 20 minute dives per day. Um, and Which has this a pretty big energetic impact too. Well, so that's exactly what they were saying. They're saying like, well, it, this may be that the prey, there's more prey abundant because there's less sea ice. And so there's that summertime has more stuff, but they're changing that. And that will have physiological in influences because that it is a big ex amount of energy more that you're spending. Mm -hmm. um, and wow. it looks like they're going after Arctic cod. So I guess the cod were a little bit deeper. Um, so yeah, it's, so it's these indirect effects of, of it's not, you know, that it's not that they depend on the sea ice to pop and stuff like that, like some seals do. It's the prey that they're doing and then how, what energy they have to put into getting that prey now and how does that affect how much energy they have and doing other things and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big difference. Um, <clears throat> So, so th they're, they're affected by that sea ice for their food, but also for their movement patterns. So Trevor mentioned that they uh, migrate. And again, this is where that variation in populations happens. Yeah. Not all of them migrate. Uh, most of them do, but for example, the Cook Inlet, which is a very, uh, it's an endangered one um, population, they don't, they just stay in Cook Inlet year round. Um, but other ones will, will go up to 1500 miles. Um, so for example, the Bering Sea Belugas and the um, travel more than 1500 miles to spend their summers in Eastern Canada. Uh, so that's a big migration. So again, that, that physiological energy expenditure, and that's yeah. why they have a lot of fat too. Um, so when they migrate and where they go is dependent on that timing of the ice formation and the, and the breakup. So um, the, you know, when the, when it breaks up, there's that open water, they're allowed to be able to go in there. And then it, when it reforms, it closes those areas and they have to leave. So, uh, as Trevor mentioned, they have to have those air holes. So it can, they can be in great danger if it freezes and they're not ready for it, right? If they stayed a little bit too long and it refreezes, they might get stuck and then they may drown. So it's a risky mm -hmm. prospect for how close you make that timing of, <laughs> when you're gonna uh, decide to head out. Um, and there have been ones that have been trapped uh, before. <clears throat> um, but so the migration though is usually they winter over in you know, a certain area farther from shore, and then they go to the summer areas for feeding and giving birth. Um, uh, and so some of these, the, the, um, the Bering Sea ones and the Chichki, there's the Bering Sea, the Chichki, and the Beaufort Seas, and then Cook Inlet, and then there's one other one I can't remember of these different stocks. Um, but it was I'll mention them all of, later too. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, <laughs> but some of them, when they migrate, 
some of them are, one of them changed the timing that they migrate because of that sea ice change, but the other ones didn't. So that seems to be more hardwired in their population as to when they do it, but the other ones are more variable. Um, so that changed the migration patterns, which also changed when they meet up <laughs> or if mm. they meet up. Right. So some of them may move and then they all end up in different areas and they may all be together during the summer, but kind of in separate areas. But um, this time they actually it changed that at some point in the fall, um, the these populations actually kind of mixed together or were in the same areas because they were migrating at the same time, which they weren't always exactly doing. So this. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to mention population wise. I think they're doing fine, too. I don't think they're endangered. Uh, the I'll get to that. Are, oh, yeah. I'll, get, I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah. I got it. I got yeah, there's, to yeah, there's some of them are doing great and some of them are not yeah. so much. Okay. Um, again, variation in population. That's kind of the theme today. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so they, uh, the, that puts important um, things to think about with this climate change and that kind of stuff in that it's not just affecting their prey, it's affecting their social stuff, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. So, you know, if they're interacting with these other populations, which they normally didn't, that could have large implications for the health of, this, of each population, for good or for bad, right? Maybe good, maybe mm -hmm. bad, who knows? But it's something that we have to think about with, and, and this is true for many populations of these different distribution patterns that are happening and how those affect these social animals. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, oh, the other really cool thing was that their site fidelity, so they usually go back to where the, the where they were born because these all these populations, at least in the US, are geographically and, and genetically distinct. So they go back to where they were born. Um, so the site that site fidelity and the migration patterns are culturally transmitted. So they learn it from their moms, which I always think is cool when you can like blatantly show that it was you know, socially learned from the mother, usually the mother. I mean, sorry guys, but in the mammal world, <laughs> dads don't do that much. <laughs> Not really. No, it's all about the moms. Um, so when, um, when do they mate? So, right, they're going to those warmer climate or the warmer, okay, quote unquote, warmer waters. <laughs> We're not talking about the tropics here. We're talking about like not zero degrees. <laughs> um, so they go there for calving um, because it's the warmer waters. So in the calves don't have that full blubber yet. Um, so that's important for them. Um, they may mate during the migration, which I thought was interesting. Like sometimes it's on the wintering grounds, but sometimes they'll do it on the move. You know, you get it when you can get it, I guess. So they're moving around. Um, so usually in later, later winter and spring is when they, uh, they mate and, um, gestation is about 15 months. They nurse for about two years and have calves every two to three years. And this is the really interesting thing is that we all know, well, it's fairly common to know that cetaceans and dolphins will basically usually give birth for most of their lives. There are some animals that have senescence where they, stop giving birth, but they're still part of the society like uh, orcas. Um, and, but these guys, uh, so this will, they'll kind of give birth most of their life. The oldest living or known um, whale was 80. That's what I saw, yeah. Yeah, wow. so it's, they, they use teeth, the teeth rings, the teeth growth, ray, growth layers, but they said that might be an under, uh, underestimate because of teeth wear. Mm -hmm. which I didn't think yep. about, right? So if you're the enamel, whatever stuff come, coming off, you're going to lose some of those layers. I think so, I saw the average lifespan was 32. So that's, that's big. Yeah. Well, and it's, and it's such a different, and again, in the population. So um, in Northwest Alaska, there was, uh, you know, they're 70, a 70 year old, but then the oldest living one in Cook Inlet is 47. Um, yeah. So it's, or close to that, you know, so it's again, variation in population. <laughs> but what's really cool is that so the pregnancy rates tend to decline after their mid forties. So anywhere from, you know, average on 10 years to 40, 40 ish years, you're having calves every couple of years. But in Northwest Alaska, there was a 70 year old with a near term fetus. Imagine being 70. Wow. Yeah. 70 having a baby. That's wild. Ooh. And then in Cook Inlet, the oldest, the, fe the oldest female looked like she had just recently given birth and she was 47. Wow. So it's uh, you, you don't know, but so they apparently can have calves very old. 
That's so cool. Mm. Yeah, it's very interesting. These guys are just so cool. Um, so my last little bit is on the social structure. And this was really interesting because uh, the new information that just came out last year um, that they kind of turned on the head what we thought was true about these animals. So they live in groups from two up to hundreds, possibly even a, you know like a thousand individuals um, when they all kind of get together, probably in the summer when they're all, I mean, and that's honestly usually when we have the information from them because <laughs> they're coast, close to the coast. When they're in their wintering areas, it's, it's kind of hard to get to them. Mm -hmm. um, so um, they're a very highly social species, very complex social structure. Uh, and so it's basically a fission fusion, similar to what you may hear about with like bottlenose dolphins, um, where they live in groups that you know are constantly changing throughout the day or over weeks, um, but they do have long-term bonds. Um, and this is the thing that's interesting is that until recently, it was thought that belugas have a structured matrilineal society. So more similar to like the Southern resident orcas where the females are in charge and everything's, you know, everybody stays with the mom. Um, but, uh, so that's kind of been like the normal of what they thought and that the groups were usually made up of maternally related individuals. So those matrilines are hanging out within their own group, right? Um, but a recent, a recent research in 2020 that looked at, uh, across a couple different populations uh, showed that the groups were comprised of kin and non-kin. Many groups were actually, many group members were paternally related rather than maternally, and some mm -hmm. were completely unrelated. So, so wow. it's kind of like, uh, I guess that's not what they do. <laughs> They're not strictly matrilineal. I mean, that may be a, a strong part of their structure, right? The mat match lines may still be an important structure of it, but it's not the be all end all. <clears throat> hmm. um, so they can have single sex groups, single age class groups. They can have mixed age sex groups. They can have brief associations to multi-year affiliations. They do, they didn't ever set alliances, but they do say that males will form long-term bonds with other males. Um, and so what they are hypothesizing is that these group composition and size may be context specific because these they, the groups that they define like all juveniles or mother calves like a mother calf dyad a mother calf triad which actually is apparently one with two calves which i guess is maybe a bit more common with belugas um most of the time that doesn't happen because it's too expensive uh, energetically um and then mother calf groups and then like adult groups only and that kind of thing each of them had with some overlap, but they each had their own kind of behaviors that were evident in those groups. So um, it may be that there's, you know, again, this context specific, like these behaviors are happening, juveniles are kind of learning what's, what to do, what to not to do, males are trying to figure out how to mate with females, you know, and of course mothers and calves are just trying to keep those calves alive. <laughs> it takes a village to raise a calf. <clears throat> so so they have these like these is this much more variation than they originally thought, um, and that but they're also maybe a more rigid multi-level society comprised of state comprised of stable social units that regularly come together and then separate. So you may have these things that are changing. They have these different groups, but there may be like these different levels of like this subgroup or this community within this population meets up with this community within this population and they hang out and they do stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so there's still basically a lot to learn about them because what we thought is really not exactly what's going on. <laughs> it's really fascinating. Well, it's just, it's so much more complex. You know, that's the cool mm -hmm. thing is like the more research we can actually do on these guys, which like you said, is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Right. Um, the more we're learning just how complex their societies and their interactions are. Yeah. And the social structure is so interesting and, and difficult to tease apart because you have to have know these individuals and then know when they're in these different groups and then analyzing all that. And it's, it's not as straightforward as some other research. I mean, and no research is really straightforward with cetaceans because it's so hard to get to them, but <clears throat> it is, it's another level of trying to tease apart exactly what's going on. Cause you're like, Oh, well, these hang out with them. That's what that means. But then you see them over there with them and you're like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> Mm -hmm. what's going on and then there's a time element too of just observing mm -hmm. those animals multiple times so that you're not just getting a one-off interaction you can actually determine mm -hmm. like oh this is happening repeatedly versus like that was just a brief encounter right. yeah it's like yeah. does this guy just like hang out with this guy just this one time and was like oh, i don't like you okay i'm never hanging out with you again or is it the beginning of a relationship that lasts for years right and you only know that if you see the individuals which we don't see every year sometimes yeah, yeah. very cool so, 
yeah, so there's lots of cool stuff about them. Um, and I'm sure Kat has much more cool stuff, although sad stuff too, because Kat always has the, the, the bad I job get the bitter to tell sweet us about part. the threats. I know, I get the bittersweet part of the podcast. <laughs> right, but you get to end with the cool stuff. So, and there's some yeah. cool stuff about these guys. So um, we will go ahead and take a quick break and be right back. All right, we are back and Kat's gonna jump into the threats and then the fun stuff. Yeah, so let's start off with a little bit of status stuff, first of all. Um, so we kind of alluded to this earlier and Trevor mentioned a little bit, um, but just to give you guys an idea. So there are five main stocks of belugas that are designated by NOAA. Um, and this is and for, the, the, for the US. Correct, yeah, so this is for the US um, population. So this is the, we have the Beaufort Sea stock, the Bristol Bay stock, the Cook Inlet stock, the Eastern Bering Sea and the Eastern Chukchi Sea stocks. So those are the five kind of main stocks that NOAA recognizes here. Um, and in terms of their, I guess, global status, um, they are registered as an endangered species under the ESA um, for the Marine Mammal Protection Act. The Cook Inlet stock and the Sac Helene Bay and Nikolai Bay and Emmer River stock, that's like one stock apparently, those are all uh, recognized as depleted under the Marine Mammal Protection oh. Act. The other ones are not. Had something. Yeah. 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 So that basically what that means is that those populations have fallen below their optimum sustainable, sustainable population levels. So that's how they recognize a stock. So it's kind of based on fishery stocks. That's kind of how they originally designated a lot of these right. um, is using those same principles. So as Cindy was mentioning the whole way along, Variation. There's a lot of variation. So <laughs> populations worldwide can be in the hundreds of thousands, but most are in the low hundreds or the mid hundreds. So again, it really is a very, very broad range in terms of population size even. Um, just to talk about those two that are listed as depleted under the MMPA. So the Cook Inlet belugas, that declined by nearly 80% since 1979. Huge. Um, yeah. And so from about 1,300 whales to an estimated 279 whales in 2018. That's insane. So, I mean, huge decline. And so the Cook Inlet, like, I'll, like Cindy said, I'll get to the threats in just a moment, but Cook Inlet is under a little bit more severe pressure from a lot of these threats. They have almost all of these happening most of the time. Um, and so we will see as we kind of go through that a lot of this does have to do with how many different pressure factors there are on these populations, whether or not they can get away from that, whether or not they can get relief from that. And there is a recovery program um, going, I guess, right now that NOAA Fisheries has, has um, instituted along with its partners. So there is, they are attempting to help that population recover. Um, and you can go check out the NOAA website if you're interested in learning more about what they're specifically doing for that. But um, yeah, that's, that's definitely, a little concerning. And then the other one that's listed as depleted, which is the Sakhalin Bay, Nikolaya Bay, Amur River, beluga whales. Couldn't they come up with like <clears throat> one word for a all little those? bit? You, you know, you'd think it's a stock in the Eastern North Pacific. It's okay. off of, off of Russia. Um, nice. you'd, you'd think, I don't know. Um, that's estimated to be around just, just shy of 4,000 animals. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they, they did do, a more recent status review of that and designated as depleted in 2016. Cause I think there was some concern that that had, had decreased significantly and it, it hadn't been re-evaluated. So this is the other thing is like having to do these reassessments of stock, it's actually quite difficult. And like, we, mm -hmm. like we've already mentioned, they live in a very inhospitable area. So actually getting to these animals doing, a lot of these are done via plane. Um, if you, I don't know how many of you had tried to fly in circumpolar Cares, <laughs> but I mean, I'm sure it's not that easy. Um, it's like that being boats out there too. Like mm, water's going to be pretty rough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really tricky to even get good population counts on these animals. And a lot of them do have significant periods of time in between population counts. So we're not getting like a step-by-step -step picture of their populations. Yeah. Which is tricky. 
Okay, so speaking of which, let's get into the threats. I'm going to leave the biggest one to last. So we'll discuss climate change right at the very end, um, as we've already touched on. Mm -hmm. But the first one um, is habitat destruction and degradation. So obviously, part of that does come from climate change, as we've already mentioned, the reduction in sea ice is a big deal for these animals, but also just the encroachment of human society on their environment. Um, as we do develop more and more into the Arctic areas, they are very susceptible to harm through that process. So one of the biggest ways that this can impact them is through physical barriers. Um, so literally, mm -hmm. literally like preventing them from getting to these sensitive areas for getting through to migrate or getting to these breeding or foraging or calving areas specifically. Um, so coastal and offshore development is a big one, um, mm -hmm. creating literal physical barriers for them on their migration path or getting to these areas. And then we have some uh, kind of less tangible barriers such as underwater noise, um, the physical pollution that could result from that uh, development, potential oil spills, the ship, ship traffic kind of disturbance area. So that whole thing does create a lot more stress potentially on the animals, but also physically preventing them from reaching areas that they depend upon for their food and for their, for their breeding. Well, it's almost um, like a, an, on land where you have roads that exactly. go through a habitat that that is a barrier to those animals. They can't get across it, even though it's like, we well, just walk across it. Like, well, right. it's not the same, so. Yeah, so it's called environmental fragmentation, basically. Yep. And so, yeah, like you said, it's exactly the same as a terrestrial ecosystem. And it's, I think it's more difficult for us to comprehend that in the ocean because we can still see the water. It's not like right. you just like culled a bunch of trees down and you can physically see that structural well, change. Like literally a wall right there. Like, well, right. No, but if the sound is there, then that might be a barrier in itself. Right, exactly. So as part of that, um, contaminants is another huge one. So if you are familiar with the marine mammal world at all, you might already know some of this, um, but belugas are one of the most contaminated marine mammals um, in so the world. So I, I have a quick story about that. When I was younger, when I was you know a budding marine mammalogist in school, I did a report and I was you know reading through some books and learned that the, especially the St. Lawrence belugas, were are so contaminated that when they stranded they had to treat their bodies as toxic waste they were that yeah. contaminated like yeah. it's bad yeah. yeah so and again because we've talked about this in previous podcasts as well um bioaccumulation up the food chain the the contaminants get stored in the fat and then basically when the animals are nutritionally stressed they metabolize that fat and they get dosed with contaminants and, they and have as a lot trevor of mentioned to store. that's what i was going to say so <laughs> six inches of fat so if that is super contaminated and you're working off of your blubber stores, that's a huge problem. Um, yeah. So for they carry huge loads. Um, they're not, again, if they're, if they're nutritionally doing fine, they may not necessarily be getting dosed with that necessarily. Um, but just based on their physiology, they're likely metabolizing more fat than some other species just because they live in cold waters. Um, and then, and what about with, with females then? Because a lot of times females will, they, especially the first, the calf they have will die because they offload all of that into the fatty milk that they have. And I would suspect that it would be even worse for these guys. Yeah, exactly. So that, that, that is likely um, uh -huh. happening more for them. Um, and again, because of that, the males are then left to be the most contaminated because they have no way to offload those contaminants. Right. Um, and so again, the more we encroach on these habitats, the more they are likely to encounter contaminants. So a huge one was the PCBs, PBDEs, Right. Um, all these kind of flame retardants and, and um, things that have since been mostly banned in the U.S., which is fantastic, but they the don't really dig the U.S., right, but they don't really degrade in the environment. So they're already there. Um, so they're not necessarily being dosed with more of those, but they're still likely retaining the ones that they've already um, absorbed. And then more contaminants are entering through runoff, through oil and gas development, Wastewater treatments, agriculture is a big one, actually. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, um, that's one of the well, that's one of the biggest ones, not in the Arctic, but like, in, and just in general. In general, yeah, it's a huge amount yeah. of pesticides and herbicides and all those things that go out. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and then you know, just just in general, other industrial processes. Um, and so again, the more that we develop their their areas, the more they're likely to encounter this type of contamination. And as we've already talked about previously, contaminate, contaminants can impede their reproductive ability, like we just talked about. Their immune function is severely compromised. Um, in general, that will just reduce the animal's lifespan. And also what I thought was really interesting is that contaminants have been um, 
pinpointed in particularly high levels of cancer in belugas from the St. Lawrence estuary. And that was, um, they've specifically seemed to have linked that to contaminants from agricultural runoff. So I um, that interesting because basically like there wasn't cancer in dolphin and like dolphin populations and cetacean populations for a long time. And now that's been starting to happen in Florida. They started seeing cancerous stuff in the bottomless dolphins that are there. So mm -hmm. it seems yeah. like that's a, a growing problem. Yeah. And I mean, just for anyone who's kind of oddly wondering why they should care about this, all of those same things we are exposed to. Right. So just to we put that in perspective. To. Yeah. So this is all stuff that impacts us too. It's not just these marine mammals. They're just unfortunately receiving the byproduct of, of what we're doing. But it's, like, it's one of those things like an indicator species where these guys are canaries in the coal mine. And these are really canaries, which I'm sure you'll, you'll mention. <laughs> but, nice. Um, <laughs> put pin in that. Uh, but yeah, they, they are saying like, they're like we, us. Like, so whatever they're being affected by, we are too. Maybe not in the exact same ways, but we are being exposed to these as well. And they can have issues. So. Yeah, absolutely. So the next one is their limited prey. Um, so again, in addition to the ways that climate change might be impacting that, like Cindy already mentioned, shifting prey species that they're going after, um, overfishing, again, development, habitat degradation have also reduced in cumulatively just a reduction in prey available to belugas. So again, as many of you know, like certain fisheries in the Arctic have collapsed in the past um, because they were overfished. And obviously the, the more you restrict the food, the more you are putting that animal or species in danger. Um, and interestingly too, I, I noticed in a recent paper that was published that they were mentioning that increasing numbers of gray and harp seals um, are also a potential source of depletion for stocks. And um, again, in the St. Lawrence estuary, well, this they was start to focusing on the that. same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they're, yeah. They're, so they're, they're they have competition. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So again, that's one that just is, is a consistent stressor mm -hmm. is the more you have to work to find your food, the more energy you're expending and the more you're using up those vital fat stores. No. Um, and potentially dosing yourself with contaminants. So ocean noise, like I said, we already mentioned that, and this does come up in most of these podcasts. <laughs> all of these animals who live in the water are susceptible to noise because they're communicating. Right. Um, so again, they're highly vocal, which I'll, again, I'll get to with the fun facts part, but they are one of the most vocal um, marine mammals that we know of. Mm -hmm. And they, again, as most of them, they depend on sound to both forage and communicate. So anything that hampers or impedes that is a potential threat. And particularly in areas like Cook Inlet, so this is a really big um, industry area. And so there's a ton of concern around ocean noise specifically in Cook Inlet because they have really high levels of vessel traffic, of development, of um, airports, of military activities. Um, they have pile driving and dredging happening there. So there's a lot of noise input in that specific area. And you know that is a, basically a closed population. Like they're not really, moving and, and, and leaving in the same way that a lot of the other ones are to get away from that noise stressor. So that's a big concern specifically for that population too. Yeah. Like, so the ones that are going to, in a summer area, they're closer to coast during that time, but then most of the other part of the year, they're not with those stressors. They mm -hmm. may have different stressors, but they're not with those, but Cook Inlet and other ones that don't migrate have that issue. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then another one is strandings. So um, mm -hmm. they may strand when um, molting. So again, like when they're using those rubbing rocks. So obviously that is a little risky because you have to time that with tides. Mm -hmm. And if you, um, if you leave that too long, you could actually get stranded on the, the rubbing rocks because it's all very shallow. It's like in two or three feet of water, um, potentially trying to avoid predators. So they basically just, they run and get themselves stuck or, or um, stranded or trying to avoid other threats like vessel noise traffic um, mm -hmm. or vessel and other traffic noises. Um, possibly even when chasing prey, if you get a little excited and kind of don't, See don't where have you're spatial awareness. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they might also do that when suffering from injuries or disease, it's thought. Um, and they will, again, rather than trying to like wheel themselves off, usually they'll just wait for the high tide to come back in yeah. um, and then swim out to deeper water, but not all of them make it. Or if well, they can be don't time too, it correctly. You're that you're that heavy, and if the tide is longer than you know, if it's a couple hours, you're probably okay. But if it's a long tide where it's going to be twelve hours before you get your your internal organs are going to get squished. Yeah, and even just you know, a little bit more nuance than that. But even just if you're already um, stressed in your body, like if you have mm -hmm. immune compromised yeah. uh, system, if you are already not doing well, 
even that one tidal cycle, surviving that is significantly exactly. less likely if you're already, uh, you know, stressed in some way. So, yeah. Um, oh, and one thing on that, I, I forgot to mention that they are, maybe, maybe you're going to, I'm going to wait until the fun facts because then I can, if you don't, if you mention it, then I won't need to mention yeah. it. And then if I don't, then I'll put it. Back. I don't think I'm going to mention it. So okay. just, just go okay. ahead and say it. Well, it's because they can go into freshwater. Yeah. See, so there's, there their go. skin is, 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 I guess, thicker. <laughs> And so they will actually go up tributaries to go up uh, to go up to catch fish and stuff like that. So it's very, that's rare. Most cetaceans, freshwater, like in dolph bottomless dolphins, freshwater will cause lesions and like very bad if they're in it for any amount of time. Um, so I thought that was interesting about these guys. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, and before we get to the rest of the fun facts, we have just the final one, which is climate change, which like yeah. I said, we've already talked about, we've already alluded to, um, but you know, as Cindy already mentioned, the sea ice distribution and timing is crucial in addition to all these other kind of knock-on effects on their prey and on their um, you know social social um, situations it's also really fascinating because they think that to some degree water temperature changes um, and the salinity changes that are happening might actually change environmental cues that they use to oh. um, navigate and, and during their migrations right. so it's also again a little bit more subtle than just while there's less sea ice for longer, and so, you know, that that's shifting things, but also like how they find these areas might be getting a little bit off. Well, it might be also be like, like you, you, like some people use, you know, maps and other people use locations to say like, oh, I turn left at the 7-Eleven and I go here and there. And not necessarily that's the exact same thing because the sea ice is going to be changing, but they may have like these indications of like, oh yeah, I, this is how this one goes there this time. So we take a turn around here and this is what this looks like at this time of year. So it helps them navigate that. And if that starts to change, yeah, that would be very disorienting. Yeah. And then again, like even just, you know, oh, that's where we hit the warm water. So we now right. know that we're in this particular flow. If that's shifting, if that's like two to three nautical miles in a different direction, yeah, that's a huge amount different than it would be otherwise. And you're going to expend a huge amount of energy trying to refine where you're going. Yeah. Well, I, mean, so, I just thought that right? was really interesting. Yeah. On the Atlantic, you know, the Gulf Stream shifts back and forth. And so and we've seen with climate change that can possibly, you know, things can possibly shut down, which would be terrible. But, you know, those shifting things could have major implications for those that use these migra like migration like this. Yeah. Yeah. And again, just one of the other like knock on effects of climate change, which I already alluded to with the previous threats, is just the fact that we can we can, as humans, access the Arctic more and more easily now yeah. um, and the Arctic environments because there is less ice. So the more that we can get up there, the more we can unfortunately create a lot of issues for these animals by being there. Um, so yeah, it's a big one. All right, let's get into the fun facts. <laughs> End on a high. Yeah. Um, okay, so we already had one, which is super cool that they can go into fresh water. Mm -hmm. um, so their Latin name, first of all, so Delphinapterus lucus. So Trevor already mentioned the apterus part is referring to a wing or a fin. And so Delphinapterus lucus literally means white dolphin without a fin. <laughs> pretty, that's pretty descriptive. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. I'm like, oh, good job, people. Sometimes they're, they're a bit more ephemeral in their naming and sometimes they're very literal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the name beluga specifically comes from the Russian word bielo. And I don't speak Russian. I have no idea if I'm saying that correctly. Um, B-I-E-L-O. And it means white. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I did not know that. Yeah. So there That's you go. Cool. Fun fact. Um, they are one of only two species in the monodontidae family. So that right. the other one is the narwhal. Um, and they also, they don't have any teeth right in the front. So I think a lot of times they're similar where they like suck their food in. Yeah. Yeah. They do the suction. Mm -hmm. And just yep. uh, for people to know, monodontinae means mono means one and dontinae means tooth. So one tooth. Yep. The so these guys do technically one. have more teeth than just yeah. one, but, um, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> they're closer. Really Nuance. Close <laughs> <laughs> um, and putting the pin in that canary reference. So these guys are known as sea canaries. And like I said, that's due to the wide range of vocalizations that they have. Um, and actually a lot of these are very bird-like. They do a lot of chirps and, and like whistles and songs. Um, they're really incredible. You can actually just YouTube, I think like beluga vocalizations yeah. and just listening to the range of them is it's incredible. Crazy. And it's possibly so, because they have that larger melon, they can actually make more nuanced sounds because that is how they change that is how they change the sound reflection and stuff that, that they're emitting. So, well, and that's the thing, like usually, you know, if you think about the you know, the goose beak and the larynx there in a, in, a in a dolphin, it's more like if you take a balloon and you and you pull it to the side and it makes that squealing noise and you can change how it is. 
But if you had another layer of that, that you could manipulate how it goes, would you be able to get all these different, different ones? But I, yeah. I also I saw, I heard they had whistles, chirps and clicks, squeals and moos. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, moos? They moo? Like a cow? Okay. Yeah. It's so cool. So yeah, just YouTube beluga vocalizations is really, really fun. Yeah. Um, and so just as we talked about at the very beginning, part of the reason that we wanted to potentially do this podcast is because we have had a beluga in our waters here in the Puget Sound. So this animal has been here. We're recording this in November, 2021. Um, and so the animal I think was first sighted in maybe late September, early October. Early October, um, I think. Yeah. I think it was early October. Yeah. And so they actually were able to identify that this animal is, uh, they think was what had come down from the Beaufort Sea and they used eDNA to do that. So eDNA is environmental DNA. And so basically instead of doing anything on the physical animal, they grab a sample of seawater directly behind where the animal has just dove or where it just swam. And they can actually pick up genetic material from that water sample and analyze that in order to determine where this animal likely came from. Um, which is just super cool. And if you go to the Pac-Man website, you can learn a little bit more about um, our hopefully planned eDNA research that we would love to start. Um, so if you want to learn more about how we're hoping to start to implement that in our area, go mm-hmm. check out our website. Um, Non-invasive. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Um, and yeah, so the Beaufort Sea population is around 40,000 animals. But again, the last they they haven't been surveyed in a really long time. So <laughs> I, I don't think they really know what the population is there. I think this, I think the 40,000 was from a survey in 1992. So yeah, it's like that's a 20 years ago. Yeah, longer than that. Um, it's interesting because I think, we, I think if most people thought that they he would have come from the Cook Inlet one, you know, the one that's closer. Right. But they're like, dude, you came from the Beaufort Sea? Like, all right, dude. Yeah. So again, they're, they're using genetic markers to compare and contrast between different yeah. populations and see which one he, he or it um, most closely aligned to. So although it appeared thin, the animal was not emaciated. So that was a good sign. Um, and yeah, the only other confirmed sighting that we've ever had in the, in the Puget Sound, at least of a beluga was off Port Defiance in 1940. So, um, yeah, the last, the last information I could find about this animal was from kind of mid October. So I'm not quite sure where it is now. It did seem like it was heading North, um, The the last time it was seen. The last confirmed sighting, I think, was heading north in Admiralty Inlet, which is basically right. the edge of the Olympic Peninsula of Washington, of the Strait right. of Washington, yeah, towards the island. So it could, that's kind of like, could go anywhere. Right. Yeah. Could you could go turn left and ocean, gone out the street. North to the strait. Right. So that was the last confirmed sighting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very cool. Very, very exciting. And again, like, this is another thing of potential climate change of these animals yeah. exploring beyond their typical range, um, you know, or just getting lost, but who knows, who knows why it was here, but it was very exciting for us and for all the researchers and a little bit concerning as to like, dude, what are you doing here? Well, that's why I always say, I will never say never. I mean, somebody may come up and be like, I saw this marine mammal in this place. I'm like, yeah, no, you didn't, but I will never say never because these weird guys do this. And they're like, all of a sudden there's a beluga in Puget Sound. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, no, you didn't see a beluga. <laughs> yeah. So actually we can link to, um, Cindy, let's go ahead and link in the show notes to, um, one of the oh, press okay, articles about that. Yeah. yeah just, yeah, just one of the press you. articles about that too. So you can actually see and, and read a little bit about that animal, but that was all I had for my fun facts. We already talked about quite Very a few cool. of the other ones. Ooh, do you have yes, another Trevor? One, Trevor? I have another one. Yes. And it, it ties things together. I think. Oh, good. Um, like about Monodonta day and the rivers and all that. Um, I'm sure some people know this. It's kind of a fun story. A couple of years ago, there was a group of belugas swimming with a narwhal. Mm-hmm. Oh, I do remember that. So, you know, the, all the articles say belugas adopt a narwhal, which mm-hmm. is, you know, I don't like that term, right. but it's just interesting to me because they're both monodontidae, today, right? So right. same family or genus order. Uh, that's yeah. a fa- fa- I think family. it's family, right? Family monodontidae. Yeah. yeah. DAE is, is family. But it was in the St. Lawrence river and it, it's apparently been recited with them traveling with the belugas. Oh, is it still with hmm. the belugas? I don't know about still, but there was multiple separate multiple sightings, sightings of it. But oh normally they you know the species wise they're in the same range ish well not really they're more narwhals are more north but interlapping range i should say right and they overlap they some. to themselves so why is it traveling with the belugas right. i don't know 
Well, but, and it's just like, did the belugas like say like, yeah, okay, you can go to cook, come with us and hang out, or was it just an owl being like, I'm hanging out with you? And it's I've probably been that. The, it's li- the only thing is a juvenile male who's probably just like doesn't yeah. know what to do. And well, and we we talked. I've talked about that uh, with uh, in other research that we've done about the you know these a lot of times it is these ma- is males that they're the ones that tend to leave anyway. They don't stay with the mothers in in the uh, you know match lines for most populations. But males are more likely to kind of branch out on their own to go sow their seeds or learn new things or just expand their range. So it's not it's not it does it makes sense that it would be a male. Um, and then sometimes yeah. maybe that maybe it's they so guys got personalities and stuff. So maybe this guy just doesn't fit. <laughs> He's trying to find somebody. He's the oddball, you know. <laughs> and this was in the St. Lawrence River too, which is apparently a thousand, like way south of where narwhals are supposed to be. Yeah, narwhals are not supposed mm-hmm. to be in the St. Lawrence. Yeah. But they're roughly the same size as a beluga, yeah. pretty yeah. much. And I guess it was behaving similarly like if the blue guys were blowing bubbles they would blow bubbles oh wouldn't wow. that be crazy if there was somehow kind of a hybrid between a beluga and i was just gonna say yeah <laughs> so i don't awesome. think they've proven that it was with the same belugas on right. the sightings probably but can you imagine if you if it was the beluga mother and then you had a narwhal baby like that had a horn yeah <laughs> What's going on? That's a kid. That's a kid story waiting to happen. I'm sorry. I'm writing right? that right now. I'm going to write that kid story. Like the ugly days. Yeah. Yeah. For Marie, he's got like I'm, he's got like I'm a half right horn now. or something. You know, like not quite yeah. full horn. But like, <laughs> oh, I don't know. If photo ID is really feasible with belugas because they're tricky, but so they do cover a spot, so they have proven it's the same one. Right. Okay. Yeah. The not. Yeah. That makes sense. But belugas. The um. I believe I was going to mention this too. We uh, the last couple conferences that we went to. Um, there was a video and a, of a of a lady that's doing beluga research in the in those summer grounds where they she has like there's a real shallow area that they all come into and she like sits up on this like like a lifeguard chair and just spends hours doing that and I believe that she was doing wasn't she doing photo ID with them I think so I yeah think so so I, I think it's more difficult it's like with porpoises where it's not like super straightforward <laughs> but you can uh, you can do it I think so. Yeah. And and for social species, that's really the big thing, right? We need to know the individuals. And so you can know things like that, whether it was the same guys or if he's just hanging out with any beluga that will take him. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So. Anyway, all right. Well, there's it's that's about, about it, I think. Um, very cool. Belugas are super awesome. We could probably keep talking for even longer, but <laughs> we'll let you guys go. <laughs> We've nerded out long enough on the cool belugas. Um, and we'll be back next week with the... Um, uh, paper review or next time and then after that we'll have another marine mammal highlight and i'm not sure what we'll do maybe we'll bring the walrus back um was it we'll is this a song is it i am the walrus isn't that, isn't that something i think so yeah i think i don't know that just came in my head anyway <laughs> sidetrack uh anyway so we'll see what we're, which we're going to do make sure you check on our instagram and facebook pages uh and the stories on instagram to choose the next marine mammal highlight We love having your guys' input. And if you have one that you're interested in in hearing about, please let us know. Um, And also be sure to check out our website. We have a gift store. We got lots of cool merch and great uh, stuffed animals and things like that for your Christmas needs (laughs) or birthday needs or whatever. If you just want one, that's also fine too. (laughs) Yourself. (laughs) All right. Uh, But check us out and all those, all the funds uh, go back to helping us continue to do podcasts like this and to our, do our research and take students and other people out into the field and show them what we do. So um, I think that's it for us and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P-A-C-M-A-M dot org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.